Chapter 1. Whispers Go Around Phil hears it first when he's at the side of a road, in the middle of a cold forest. A few kind strangers sitting around him, all of them choosing to stay together for the night. Mindless, bloodthirsty monsters are rare in these lands, but they all have enough experience to be wary of the dark. They're talking around a small fire, Phil drinking warm tea from a cup that warms his palms as the others chat about their lives, their experiences, and their sights. He's seen plenty, maybe more than most, really, but it's always nice to hear of others' tales. He would speak of his own adventures, he would, only he's not in the mood for the strange look in people's eyes when they glance to his wings, gaze dragging over the necklace around his neck that has a faint red glow. People always ask the same questions, and after a while, Phil just gets tired of it. At the very least, he's not the only one who's otherworldly, for there's a woman sitting across from him with the horns of a ram growing out of her head, and her ears are nowhere like a human's. She's not as quiet as Phil, and she seems to have gotten past the usual curiosity of others rather quickly, chatting happily with the others around her, her ears flicking as she laughs along with the others' stories. Phil sips at his drink with a bored face, his attention going to a couple sitting beside him, their hushed voices getting more sharp as one of them seems to bring something up. He listens in, looking off into the fire as they argue. You can't be serious, surely not? The man sitting beside Phil asks, leaning in close to his partner, eyes wide. That's got to be bullshit! It's not. We can check at the next village we come across. I swear, the priest will say the same thing. You tell me this now? Phil raises his eyebrows as the two men bicker, getting so fired up to the point that the group around them tries to get them to calm. One of the men waves around a paper frantically, and Phil can't quite see what's on it. Only red scribblings from what he can catch. It gets to the point of shouting and pushing, and at that point... Phil takes it upon himself to stand up, his wings shifting out a bit as he puts his cup to the side on the ground. Whoa, 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 mate, calm down. Phil says, and everyone goes hushed when he gets to his feet. It's not unusual. Phil's always had that vibe. It could be the wings, he thinks. People seeing them and associating Phil with being powerful in some sort of way. It could be the way he's not human, too where sometimes his nails are just a little too sharp, and his eyes are a bit too bright. And it gets to a point where other travelers can't hold eye contact with him, because he simply doesn't pass for a safe monster anymore. Sometimes it's annoying. Sometimes it works in his favor. Either way, the couple looks away when Phil walks over to them, standing over them as they sit back down onto the ground. One of them still has that paper in his hands crumpled in his grip. Phil feels curiosity burn in his chest, and he knows he's going to get something out of this one way or another. What are you both yelling over? Surely you can work it out? Phil grins, trying to keep a friendly voice to lower the tension running in the air. The two strangers glance at each other, then to Phil, who gives a worried look to them both. He barely knows them at all only knowing that they've agreed to stay the night with this small makeshift group. But he knows they're close to each other from the way they've held on to each other throughout the entire night. Something that would make them go into an argument? Phil feels like it's important. Nick, he... he's been hearing tales from the villages we've been visiting. One of them says, looking away from his partner with a sigh. And he's only decided to tell me about the possible end of the world now. Nick, who holds the paper in his hands with a hesitant face, shifts in his seat, leaning in towards his partner. Well, it's just recent. We don't know. What do you mean you don't know? You just said that it would result in total and utter despair and destruction. Don't sugarcoat it. His partner snaps, waving his hands around as Phil holds back a snicker from the way he yells it. I'm trying to be optimistic. Nick yells back, his voice squeaking for a moment, and he pauses to clear his throat turning to Phil, who gives a questioning face. Okay, okay, you mind listening to me ramble for a minute or two? Go ahead, mate. 
if it'll help with your relationship problems. Phil grins, crossing his arms. Someone snickers behind him. Nick huffs, face a tad red as he smooths out the paper in his hands. Bump in the road. I have a habit of delaying important details. End of the world shit, yes. That's definitely something you should just keep from me for a whole two fucking weeks. His partner mutters under his breath. Nick sighing loudly before continuing. Okay. So, me and Lucas? Nick nods ahead to his partner, who stares off into the distance with a grumpy face. We've traveled past more than a few towns in our, er, adventures, and each town I tend to visit the churches, mostly because the priests there are usually kind, and I like a bit of luck and magic before we set off. Nick shrugs, Phil humming and wrapping a hand around his necklace. Lately, though, I've gotten a few stories that have been, well, overlapping, between the priests and the more magical people of the town, and it's painting a story I'm not sure I want to hear. Phil leans back on his heels, and he feels the warmth of the fire reach his wings, the people sitting around staring with a tense type of listening. There's only been a handful of true tales and destinies written down in stone, and Phil's heard them all before. They're all a part of life. The dragon that resides in the end. The rare summoning of withers across the lands. The mindless, dangerous, nocturnal creatures that seek to only hurt and the somewhat common sight of people like Phil, human-like, but not entirely. It's the way of life, in their world, and Phil knows it fairly well, a little too well. And he knows that the suggestion of something that important being brought up isn't something to look over. What, is there a new type of world out there, or, or an undiscovered creature? Someone asks, eagerness flowing from their words as Phil shakes himself out of his thoughts. Not yet, I think. Nick frowns, looking at the paper in his hands and sighing. Lucas, next to him, reaches a hand out for the paper, and Nick gives it over, Lucas skimming over the words and finally giving the story everyone is waiting for. He's been collecting tales from people across the towns we've been traveling in. So far, what he's gotten is that something big is coming. An apocalypse type of threat. What, so, creatures like the Withers? The woman with horns asks, Phil stepping to the side as everyone leans in. More, Lucas says, face going dark. Monsters specifically born to destroy and hurt, but not mindless like the night ones, more like... He trails off, eyes flicking to Phil. The woman with horns swears loudly, and the group around Phil raises up in voices, yelling over each other with concerns and questions, Nick trying to answer the best he can. Phil takes a few steps back, and no one sees him leave, and no one notices when he raises his wings out and goes into the sky, flying over the trees and out into the night. He's tired, and he knows he shouldn't push it too much, because it's going to end with a terrible mood in the morning. But his curiosity burns and he can only wonder with a slight concern in his heart over the thought of something that big. Half-monsters, born only to create destruction in their path? It sounds like a cruel existence. And Phil knows more than anyone that every half-monster he's ever come across wants only peace and equality. He's one of the lucky ones, one of the nicer-looking ones. He's seen people with unnaturally shaped mouths and unsettling appearances, He's seen people like him with hissing voices and jagged scars across their face, only for those same people to be the sweetest, kindest people he knows. Sometimes, people like him have to face stupid people. People who are scared and act accordingly. Sometimes, the reputation of half-monsters gets hurt, from one stray tale of a desperate monster lashing out against cruel people. Phil can't help them all, even if he's one of the lucky ones even if he's one of the more approachable ones, with features that make most travelers admire him rather than be scared. But if this tale is true, if this story is true, he needs to do something. So he flies, over the trees and into the night, set on getting to the nearest village. And once he does, he will ask. He will find details, 
he will find more and more words and stories passed around, and he will keep looking. Because with such a story like that, the first thing that a usual traveler might focus on is the threat. Phil can only think about the pain of someone to become such a threat. So he flies. He gets to the village as the sun comes up. The air colds around him as he lands in the grass far off, choosing to walk the rest of the way through the field to the scattered buildings. The grass is slightly wet underneath his shoes, and his back aches from flying the whole night. But he only yawns and tells himself that rest can wait, once he's sure of this. There's only a few people walking along the street when Phil gets to the village, and a few give him the usual glances onto his wings, and he can't help the relief he feels when their eyes are full of awe rather than fear. His wings have that effect. He's glad they do. He makes a beeline straight to the church building, the bells ringing out across the small town as Phil stalks down the stone path, eyes set ahead with a sense of determination in his walk. People seem to move out of his way when he gets close, and usually he would lighten up his tone and not be so fierce, but he needs to know. He knocks against the wooden doors of the church three times, sighing as he feels fatigue creep up on him. He rolls his shoulders back and raises his chin, satisfied when he hears a click of the door being unlocked and the creak of the wood moving. The church is quiet, dim and warm, and the priest is kind and soft-spoken, not even giving a glance to Phil's wings or his necklace. On another day, Phil would be grateful. Instead, he gives his questions as soon as they're both inside. He gets an answer. Somehow, it's not the answer he wanted. Sleep becomes scarce in those weeks, as Phil flies from town to town, checking in with people of all sorts of magic, visions, and feelings. He carries around a journal and writes down the details of it all, crafting together a proper telling. As he figures it out, he's not the only one, because the stories spread to travelers, common folk, kings, and conquerors. The stories go across the lands as Phil lays it out for himself. Within a few weeks, Phil has met over a dozen different people from each village, and they all tell the same. Three children. Three monster children are to be born in the years to come. They're supposed to be born with unimaginable abilities. Powers that could destroy so much so easily. If they're left to grow, the world as everyone knows it will fall into nothing but chaos. As fear runs across the lands, so does a certain rushed panic, because from what the stories and visions and tellings say, the first one has already been born. And so everyone rushes to find it, so that the start of something terrible can be put to an end before it makes a mark. People are desperate, in the way that one fights against a wither so it'll stop ravaging against their home, in the way that one rebels and defends with nothing much to lose except life itself. Phil is even more desperate, and even more determined. And when he finds a lead on the first child, a small kid said to have bright pink hair and blood-red eyes, Phil holds a knife to someone's throat that night and whispers threats because he's desperate to stop the sort of destruction everyone is terrified of. But he will not end it through killing a child. He can only hope that he can find said child before anyone else does. And he will. Chapter 2 The Blood God is a lot less dangerous than you'd think, actually. The first kid is rumored to be in a small, warm village. One that barely has any people at all, yet is never quiet. Specific details can't be found out, and people just get vague descriptions of that same village. Small, warm, but never silent. Phil flies to multiple towns. Small towns with scattered buildings and roaring rivers beside them. And he searches for the description he has. Pink hair, blood-red eyes. Should only be four years old now. He comes up empty, even though the reports say the kids should be within this large area. Phil isn't the only one searching. There's plenty of travelers, hunters, specific groups sent on their way with the sole purpose of finding the same kid Phil is looking for. 
Phil has a slight advantage with his wings, and he may be exhausted these days, but he can travel quickly, through the skies. Most of the stronger groups have their own horses and supplies, though, and they tend to catch up with Phil, a bit too quick for his comfort. Rumors go around that there's a mysterious force protecting the first kid from being found. Really, it's just Phil poisoning people's water supply and making them get sick so he can get ahead. Phil comes up empty again on his third town, one where he was sure that he would find the kid. But there's no one to the description there. The town is empty. Too silent. It's hot. The sun is coming down in a wave of heat, and the dust kicking up under Phil's shoes make him want to rest and take a drink. He continues looking around instead, and he finds old, broken houses that are warm and full of cobwebs. Walking into one of the homes, the door creaks loudly as he pushes it open, and the floorboards under him are covered with dust, dead bugs, and some stains that make Phil wonder who once fought here. Hello? Phil says, and it resounds through the old house, the only sound that Phil can hear other than the creaking of the wood under his feet. Is anyone here? It's empty, of course, and Phil walks into the house with hesitant steps, eyes dragging over the broken bookshelves and books scattered across the floor. The windows are cracked, and old torches lay in the corner, not having been lit for so long. The roof over Phil's head holds a giant hole, as if something crashed through it, leaving a crater beside Phil's feet, a dip in the broken wood floor. He hears a hum. It's not a person's hum, not someone singing, but a consistent, low, humming noise, almost unnatural. Phil copies it for a moment, before looking around, trying to focus on where it is. He finds that it comes from right below him, and he takes careful steps around, the wood creaking in a way that he now knows is because they're hiding something. Stretching his wings out as much as he can in the room he's in, Phil takes an axe to the ground and bashes through the wood, flipping himself off the ground when it starts to crumble, crashing below loudly. There's dirt and dust thrown into the air, and Phil wipes at his face, sighing at the hot air that kicked up with the floor falling, and lowers himself down to whatever he's uncovered. He finds another portal, bright purple, surrounded by rubble and discarded weapons. It's old, it's cracked at the edges, but it's still active. Phil wonders who made it, here, underneath an old town of all places. He wonders who fought here who went through it. He stands in front of it, in the stuffy air surrounding him, staring at the purple glow for a few minutes as he contemplates if this would be a waste of time or a lead. He doesn't have much time. He needs to keep searching, because he's not the only one traveling the lands. But he's the only one who seems to not want to end this in young blood. It doesn't take long for him to go through it, sword gripped tightly in his hand. It's been a while since Phil's been in the nether. He knows the place well. He has friends who live there, who hide there, and he's gone there for resources time and time again. The heat of it all, and the way the netherrack cracks under his feet when he walks, it's all familiar. He knows it too well. One thing that throws him off is the houses made from blue wood far off in the distance. It's a small village, barely enough to even be considered a village at all. And as Phil approaches it, he can see a few people walking around in their day-to-day -day life. He keeps a distance, observing the village from afar, kneeling down behind a hill of netherrack, not wanting to bring attention to himself with whatever this is. There's cobblestone paths in between the houses. Houses that are made from nether planks. Wood that Phil recognizes is from the blue forests that reside here. The people look normal. Human and they're all suited up in some sort of armor, walking quickly wherever they go, always on guard. A screech from a ghast distracts Phil, and he looks over to the sea of lava that's not too far, far down below the ledge that this town and Phil is on. Phil's mind swarms with questions. For how long this village has been here, why would anyone other than monsters be living here? 
but he doesn't have long to think about it, because a fireball is coming his way. He dodges it easily, kicking himself into the air and swinging his sword at his side as the ghast screeches again. The fireball and explosion has given away the fact that he's here, and he can see people staring from the village, not coming to help, only watching as Phil maneuvers through the air, swinging his sword against the next fireball and hitting it, so it'll land somewhere where it won't make too much damage. He has a bow on him, secured at his back, and he flies right towards the ghast, lava far below his feet as he grabs an arrow that's tucked away, pulling back the bow. He dodges another fireball and fires. It hits perfectly, and Phil didn't expect otherwise, making his way back to solid ground over to the village. The people still stay where they are, and Phil realizes it's because of how the houses are placed. It hides them just enough from any other threats. Phil had been out in the open from the portal. He glides over to the people, landing just a bit far off and putting his weapons away, making a slow walk towards them. When he gets close, there's a moment of hesitant silence as he scans the people's faces, all surprise and full of relief. There's a screech of another ghast far off, and Phil hears the sound of something burning high up. Fires burning on and on above the village. A small town, warm, never quiet. Who would have thought it would be in the nether? Phil clears his throat, the people shifting and murmuring to each other. A few look near tears. I'm looking for a kid. Should be around four? Pink hair, red eyes. Phil says, and he gets nods and hurried glances in response. Oh, finally, someone says, walking up to Phil, and he freezes a bit as they wrap him in a hug. He thinks they might be crying. He's in a bit of an awkward situation. Finally, someone's here. Yes, we have it. It's here. I'm so sorry we couldn't end it ourselves. We just... The woman takes a step back, wiping at her face, taking a moment to compose herself. Oh, finally, it's over. Sorry? Phil asks, tilting his head as he looks around, seeing a few people walk off into the village with a hurried pace. The monster. We know about the apocalypse, the destruction it's supposed to bring. She says, and Phil feels his heart go cold. You know? Phil repeats, feeling panic grip his heart. Because they know. They have the kid, and they've heard of it, so... Is he alive? Phil asks quickly, the woman nodding. Yes, we couldn't do it ourselves, so we've been waiting, she says, and Phil can't say anything in response to that. His mouth feels dry as the realization dawns over him that this kid, the kid who has so much in his destiny, has been living in a village who has been desperately waiting for just one traveler to come over and kill the kid. Where is he? Phil asks, and she sighs, giving Phil a smile before turning around. Phil looks with her, down the cobblestone path of the town, and he sees it. A small glimpse of pink hiding underneath a small crevice under a building. One of the villagers trying to coax him out. He's so small, is the only thing Phil can think. Because the kid looks like he would only reach up to Phil's knees, and he can see a tiny hand swipe out at one of the villagers, refusing to move. Phil walks past the woman with a rushed pace, and she takes a double take before following at Phil's heels, stammering out more of an explanation. Phil really doesn't need it. The kid is here, and he's alive. That's all Phil needs. We know that it would be better for us to kill it when it's younger, but we all couldn't do it when he was smaller, and we can't do it now, she says quickly, as the two of them go down the path. We're just people who want to be left alone. The last thing we wanted was the responsibility of killing a kid. Hmm. Phil gives a hum in response. The people taking a few steps back as Phil comes closer. I'm glad you didn't. They stop in front of the little hole, and Phil kneels down, the woman taking a step back, everyone huddled around, far from Phil, watching with anticipation to see what he will do. Phil barely pays attention to the people around him. Instead, he looks to the hole in the ground and sees small hands resting at the opening. Then a head pops up, 
eyes glowing. The people behind Phil take a step back in fear, murmuring and on guard, wary. Phil thinks he might be dying. Does he live there? Phil asks, scooting closer, but not too much to spook the kid. Bright red eyes blink up at Phil, mesmerized, and Phil feels the same way. Because there's no possible way that the so-called monster that's supposed to bring death and destruction can be so... tiny. He's a pig hybrid. Phil can see it. The way his ears are pointed and the tusks just barely coming from his mouth. Maybe years from now he would be appropriately terrifying, strong and deadly. But right now, at this moment... He's cute. There's literally no other way Phil can describe him with those bright red eyes. Yes, it's been under there for a while now. We still can't get it out. The woman behind Phil says, slight bitterness on her tongue. We sometimes kick food under, out of mercy's sake. Phil nods, but he really isn't listening. Him and the kid locked in a staring contest. The kid looks away first and it's to stare at Phil's gold hair, hanging loosely around his shoulders. Are you going to kill it? Someone asks, voice hesitant, and the village holds their breath as Phil moves closer to the little gap, hands reaching in to where the monster resides. He's a madman, some of them think. He's going to get his hand bitten off. He's going to get killed. The people are dead silent frozen with fear as Phil leans forwards and reaches his arms in, a few people considering pulling Phil back for his own safety. It's not needed, though, and Phil pulls the kid out of the hole, setting him on his feet. He stays kneeling on the ground, hands brushing off the dirt on the kid's shirt, and the village has taken multiple steps back now, eyes wide. Now, what's your name? Phil asks quietly, as the kid stares at Phil's hair, before reaching a hand out and yanking at it. Ow. Someone in the crowd gasps. Phil thinks he might see someone actually faint, from how they're acting. And he just turns his head to them, trying to get his hair to stop getting tugged at. Uh, does he have a name? Phil asks, grinning out into the crowd, who stare at him like he's on his deathbed. Technoblade. Someone mumbles and the crowd nods, murmuring amongst themselves. The Blood God. That's his name. Ah. Phil takes that in, a bit amused at the dramatic naming. But Techno turns his head when someone says it, and the crowd shrinks back, seeming to immediately regret saying his name at all. Techno, then? Techno turns back to Phil, and still has a hand tangled in his hair, Phil gently tugging his grip off before standing up. Kill it now, quickly! Someone whispers out, as Phil stretches his arms up, yawning. Man, he needs a nap. Yes, hurry! Someone agrees, and the crowd gives out words of encouragement to hurry, do it now. Phil resists the urge to scoff. I'm not killing the kid. Look at him. He waves a hand to Techno who stares at Phil's outstretched hand before grabbing Phil's pinky with a loose grip. Phil has to clear his throat and keep his attention to the scared crowd as Techno turns Phil's hand over, looking at it with curiosity. He's not going to hurt you. He will! Maybe not now, but soon! You have to stop it while you still can, that's why you're here, aren't you? The woman who led Phil yells, stepping in front of the crowd. Phil levels her with a blank look blinking and letting her sit in suffocating silence, before glancing down to Techno, who looks up with those same bright red eyes. Oh, he's just adorable. No. Phil says simply, smiling down at the piglin. Techno gives an imitation of a smile back, baring his teeth and showing the small, sharp fangs off. Someone does actually faint out of fear when he does that. Phil gently pulls his hand away from Techno, stepping in front of the kid. I'm not here to kill him. I'm planning on taking him in, raising him. The crowd looks at him like he's lost his mind. Phil couldn't care less, because Techno behind him has noticed Phil's wings, 
and he reaches a hand out to them, curiosity written all over his face. Phil shifts his feathers and snickers when Techno nearly jumps, surprised at the fact that the wings even move. Makes sense, really, if the nether is all he knows. Phil will make sure that won't be forever, though. R raise him? The woman trails off, and Phil turns his head back to the people, half of the crowd having retreated away from the lunatic that is Phil, the other half keeping far, far distance with wide eyes. You want to care for a monster? A creature that will tear apart life as we know it? I mean, mate. Phil nods his head to Techno, who glances at the woman for a moment, the woman taking a small step back. He's just a little pig. She stares at Phil like he's absolutely insane, and Phil is getting tired of these looks already. He's itching to pick up the kid and leave, but she clears her throat, straightening up before trying to get it through Phil's head again. You do understand that you're caring for the very thing that is meant to bring destruction and chaos to our world, right? The woman asks, Phil looking behind him fondly as a tiny techno grabs at the end of his wings, fascinated by the feathers. He's just a child. Phil answers distractedly, humming as his wings get gently yanked out. He's the first of three to destroy life as we know it. Shouldn't we, well, get rid of him? Oh, no. Phil raises his eyes back to the woman, a silent threat in his words. Believe me, I have my own way of preventing the apocalypse. She stays silent at that, and Phil shrugs, turning to the kid again, who lets out a small squeal at Phil's feathers getting pulled away from his reach. Okay, Techno, come on. He kneels down, reaching his arms out, and Techno goes to grab his hair first before staring into Phil's eyes, Phil staring patiently back. Then he gets what Phil's asking, and leans forward, wrapping an arm around Phil's neck, but still keeping a hand in his hair. Phil's not sure what the deal is with that. Maybe the kid is just grabby. Either way, Phil picks up Techno off the ground, sighing happily at the relief in his chest at finally having this kid out of danger, in Phil's arms. He turns to the woman, and the few people still scattered around, speechless at the fact Phil's just picked up the thing they've perceived as a dangerous threat for the past few months. Well, have a good day. Phil waves a hand, then he's off, flying up into the air. He makes his way over the buildings and back to the portal, hearing some yelling as he goes, but he just ignores it in favor of looking at Techno, who's holding on for dear life, looking very surprised at the fact they're now off the ground. Not scared, though, and Phil's glad for that. Phil ignores the screech of a ghast noticing them, and goes straight to the portal, holding on tight to Techno and going right through to the other side. It's still dusty when he walks out, and he sneezes before flying his way up out of the broken basement, and he makes his way out of the house, into the sunlight and the blue sky. He walks away from the village, holding back another yawn, and instead making some internal plans on where to rest for the night, going through the grassy field. Glancing down to Techno, he finds that the kid has his eyes squeezed shut, his face half hidden into Phil's shirt, a death grip on a lock of Phil's hair. You can open your eyes now, Phil says softly, and he only gets a small noise in response, Techno barely nudging. Phil stops where he is, looking around at the green field, peaceful and quiet, a gentle breeze flowing through. There's nothing scary. Look. Phil whispers, and he holds Techno's head close to his, Techno opening his eyes just the slightest bit to see Phil's face. Phil glances up, and after a second, Techno copies, looking up as well. After that, he can't get Techno to stop staring at the blue sky. Chapter 3 My Son, My Son One thing that Phil notices right off the bat after acquiring one Technoblade in his care, is that he's very quiet. 
observant, curious, and brave, no doubt, but he's silent, never saying a word, and only making a few sounds here and there. A squeal whenever Phil doesn't let him hold his hair right away. A small whine when he's woken up from sleep. He can understand Phil just fine. He seems to know language as a whole, it's only that he doesn't say a word in response. Phil doesn't mind. The kid is good company anyway. On the first three days of having techno, Phil puts away his worries for the next kid, for the ongoing search that will need to continue, and works on gaining trust. Because the last thing he wants is for techno to be under his watch, but to not trust Phil. Techno has a liking to gold, it seems, for when Phil looks through the gold coins in his bag, wanting to count and see what he has for the next town they'll eventually travel to, Techno practically throws himself forward, reaching into Phil's bag and nabbing at whatever coins he can grab in his tiny hands. He grabs a few handfuls and tries to hold them all, even as they spill and fall onto the forest floor. And Phil laughs when Techno looks up at him with pleading eyes, as if he's asking for Phil to help and make the coins stop falling. I need those, Techno. I was counting them. Phil says gently, leaning forward and reaching for the few coins dropped in the dirt, collecting them up in his palm. Techno makes an annoyed noise as he drops another coin. They're hiding out in the middle of a forest, a small campfire put to the side, a little bed of leaves on the ground. Phil doesn't mind sleeping on the forest floor. He's slept in worse places. And Techno seems to not have any problem with sleeping right on Phil, with Phil's wings covering him and shielding him from the cold at night. The first nights are everything to Phil. And the first time Phil tells Techno to sleep, Techno lays down beside Phil, shoving his face into Phil's shoulder and curling up into a ball, trying to be as small as possible. Phil can't help himself in scooping up the kid into his arms, tucking Techno's head under his chin and staring up at the stars, his heart squeezing as Techno falls to sleep, barely visible under his feathers, a hand holding onto Phil's hair even then. He's so small, and Phil swears over and over to any gods that are out there that he will give everything to make sure Techno will grow up safe. Phil sleeps lightly these days, half so he'll notice if Techno wakes up, half so he can run if they get found out by anyone else. He doesn't know if word has traveled yet, of Phil taking the first kid, but he doesn't want to take chances, so he travels carefully, stays vigilant. But for this morning, it's quiet and calm, and Techno runs around the smoldering campfire when Phil tries reaching for his coins back giving a weary smile at the piglin, who only blinks back, arms full of gold. Techno has a liking to gold, for sure, and that seems to translate to why he grabs Phil's hair so often. But it's also not the only reason, because Techno seems to also have a liking to anything soft. Phil can't imagine there's anything soft and comfortable in the nether, especially in that little hole Techno had been residing in. So it makes sense in the way that Techno grabs onto his hair, or is fascinated with Phil's wings, sticking his small hands into them when Phil's asleep, Phil having to wake up to someone attacking his feathers. Even right now, Techno is entirely content, with Phil's robe around his shoulders, coins falling over in his hands as he sits on the floor. Phil had been able to scrub most of the dirt off of Techno in a nearby river, and while Techno's clothes looked ragged and worn, Phil told himself they would just have to work until he got new clothes from the next village. So he gave his outer layer of clothes to Techno, and while the fabric hardly fit, and it dragged on the floor as Techno moved around, he refused to let go of it, and the piglin rubs his face against the sleeves every now and then when he thinks Phil isn't watching. Techno's hair is pulled back neatly in intricate braids, courtesy of Phil and his knowledge of doing hair. Techno had enjoyed it when Phil tended to his bright pink hair, now clear of dirt, after Phil had washed it out. Phil had combed out the slight tangles with his fingers and wove them into a braid, 
and when he was done, Techno had turned and given Phil a confused look, as if asking why he had stopped tending to his hair. When he realized it was up in a braid, he ran his small fingers over it in wonder, then knelt up to Phil and tugged at Phil's own golden hair. Small moments like that, little moments where Techno looks to him with thoughtful red eyes and reaches a hand out, it makes Phil's heart rest easy. Stress falling away for just a few minutes longer. Because this isn't the end. Phil still has two more kids to save, but Techno is a good distraction for a day or two. Phil enjoys the responsibility given to him. Enjoys the way that he wakes up to Techno poking at his wings, and falls to sleep with Techno holding onto his hair. Techno follows behind him wherever he goes, watches with curious eyes at the side of the river while Phil is busy catching fish with the simple dagger he keeps on him. At one point, he tries holding his hand out to Phil with pleading eyes, wanting to hold the weapon, use it the way Phil does. Phil doesn't hand it over, and only insists that Techno put his feet in the water first. And when Techno squeals at the chill of the river, Phil laughs. After that, Techno doesn't try asking for the dagger again, and glares at the rushing water like it's cursed him. Techno doesn't like the cold, Phil finds. Which makes sense. He runs warm and comes from the nether as a whole. The chill of the night and the freezing river is something Techno has never dealt with, and it's something he decides he doesn't like. When he gets too cold at night, he hits a small fist against Phil until he wakes up, so that Phil will wrap his wings tighter around him and keep the night chill out. He absolutely refuses to leave Phil's arms in the early morning, when the chill still hasn't left the forest. The first time he saw the river was something Phil thought was hilarious, for Techno approached it like the water would reach out and bite him. He had actually panicked when Phil took off his shoes and walked into the moving water, Techno holding out his arms and making a distressed cry as Phil gave words of reassurance that he was fine. Techno wouldn't follow Phil into the water, but he was fine with Phil carrying him over the rushing currents, and he stared at the river below him, at the few fish that swam by, and would look to Phil with questioning eyes, as if asking why the river was so quick. Phil tended to fill the silence between them by rambling on and explaining all he could about the world around him. Techno never had to ask a single question, and Phil would answer them all. It just keeps on going, the water moves along the rocks, and it carries the fish through the forest. All the way to a lake, maybe, or even an ocean. And, oh, I bet you won't like the ocean that much, mate. It can be even colder than this sometimes. He had went on carrying Techno over the river and pointing out the light blue of the currents. Techno had been able to stick a hand into the water after Phil explained what it was, but he did not like it at all, for it was freezing. He liked it even less when Phil had to scrub dirt off his face in the river, and he clung to Phil for warmth as Phil continued to tell Techno of the ocean, of the water. But don't go staring at the sun too much, it's not good for your eyes. You can stare at the clouds, though. Look. See, they move through the sky. Look at how they're all so big, so vast. Phil told. Techno, turning his head down as soon as Phil warned against the sun, but hesitantly looking up again when Phil pointed a finger up at the clouds. And Techno pointed up a hand as well, staring at a bird flying high. That's a cricket, mate. Hear it? They're small little things. They can't do much, but they love talking late at night. Phil whispered, as Techno laid in his arms under the stars, eyes wide and wary as a cricket chirped near their campfire, Phil letting him know that the sound was just of a small creature and nothing harmful. And I know you're not listening to this one, but I swear it seems like something you'd love. They're all quite bright up there, and the moon as well, constantly lighting up the night sky over our heads. Phil murmured quietly, as Techno listened while half asleep, the two of them staring up at the sky through the trees. A few days of living in the forest, Phil's gotten restless, and Techno has gotten tired of the food that Phil feeds him. Simple greens found by the riverbank, a few fish caught out of the water. So, 
Phil stretches his arms up with a yawn and plans for the next village and puts Techno to sleep early while the sun is still up. Techno gives him a confused look when Phil lays down with him, and Phil explains that they need to travel, but it has to be at night, when they can move under the dark and not be spotted. Techno seems to understand anyway, and shoves his head into Phil's shirt, falling to sleep within minutes. Phil closes his eyes with him and wakes up to the light night sky, sunset just barely ending, the last bits of sun fading away. Phil takes back his robe from Techno, checks his bag, lets Techno run a hand through the coins and makes sure he has a knife on him. And he picks up Techno in his arms, stretches out his wings. Remember the first day, Techno? Where I had flown out of the portal? Phil asks, looking up at the dim sky, Techno shaking his head. No, you had your eyes closed, didn't you? Keep them open this time. I swear it'll be okay. Then he's off, and Phil leaves the ground with a grin, Techno holding onto his shirt with a death grip. Leaning in as close as possible as Phil flies above the trees, above the forest. The land is beautiful, even in the dim moonlight. And Techno turns his head up and down, up to the clouds over their heads, down to the trees passing under them both. He looks to Phil with a toothy grin copying Phil's own expression. There's a village not too far off, and it only takes a few minutes of flying before Phil sees the lights of the buildings, the stone paths of the streets. He lands nearby and holds Techno close, walking quickly and silently, making his way around the back of the buildings rather than out in the street. It's a small town, quiet with nightfall, and only a few people walk past. Phil making sure to avoid each one. Techno stays absolutely silent the entire time, and Phil knows it's because he's explained the danger of others finding him. He's explained as kindly as he could that other people can be dangerous and cruel, and that while there's kind people out there, Techno needs to be careful. Techno hadn't entirely understood that one, only stared at Phil's wings, grabbed at the necklace around Phil's neck, and stared on in silence, a thousand thoughts running through his head. Phil spots a small clothes shop soon enough, looking empty of customers, but still open, and he moves to it with light steps, making his way across the street. There's a bell that rings as he walks in, and a person at the counter. The shop is full of fabrics and clothes on display, tucked away beside the walls and Techno looks to the person at the counter, to the fabrics laying around, then looks to Phil, and demands to be let down by hitting a small fist against Phil's shoulder. Okay, okay, mate. Go play, but don't mess up anything, Phil says softly. And Techno takes off running as soon as he's put down, going to run his hands over whatever he can reach. The person at the counter is a bright young woman, smiling warmly as she sees Techno run off into the small shop, and she turns to Phil with a friendly nod. Hello, welcome to Emmy's Fabrics. She chimes, and looks to Techno again with a fond look as Phil puts his bag onto the counter in front of him. Your son is cute. We don't get much kids with the travellers these days, much less ones who are this excited over clothes, she says, as Techno messes with the curtains by a small window. He likes the texture of soft things, I think. Phil shrugs, and the woman's eyes glance to the wings on Phil's back, looking shocked for a moment before catching herself. Uh, well, that's something I'll keep in mind. I'm sure I'll have some shirts his size that are soft enough. She smiles, and Phil recognizes the small look of curiosity, of wanting to ask questions. Because half-monster people, that's always something others have questions over. Do you have any shoes as well? I believe I do. There's quite a few stored in the back. We don't usually put them on display, they tend to get stolen. She nods, Phil glancing to the few outfits up on display, to the window in the front that shows off the clothes to the street. The window is half covered by a curtain and Phil wants to pull the curtain all the way as a small group of people come down the street, torches in hand, 
and swords at their sides. Now who was that? Phil mumbles, and Emmy hums, waving a hand. A hunting group looking for the blood god. She explains, as if it's a normal occurrence. And it really must be, with so many in the lands looking for techno. People like them come through the village every now and then. The kid still hasn't turned up, but they're still searching. Phil watches as Techno fiddles with the curtains. And he holds a hand out, whispering harshly. Techno, stay away from the windows. Techno freezes, and as does the woman at the counter, eyes going wide. Techno takes a slow step back from the end of the curtain, then moves forward again, moving the curtain all the way so the display window isn't showing through, the inside of the shop hidden from the people in the street. He looks to Phil to see if that was all right, and Phil nods, smiling. Techno goes to close the other curtains. I'm sorry, I, uh... She clears her throat, smiling. What is your son's name, may I ask? Phil glances to Techno, who closes the curtain of the other small window, then goes off to play with some fabrics hanging off a nearby table. Techno? Phil answers, reaching down under his coat. Techno. She trails off. Her smile is strained. Lovely name. I... Do you mind if I grab something from storage? She goes to move her arms away from the counter, eyes looking at Techno. Techno with his pink hair, pointed ears, small little tusks. Phil moves quickly and stabs his dagger into the counter right where the woman's sleeve is, and he leans in close, talking quietly. Technoblade. His name is Technoblade, and I know very well who he is. And I know you know who he is. She looks at Phil with wide eyes, taking in a shaky breath, eyes flicking to Techno, and back to Phil. You. There's a cursed child in my shop. You've brought a dangerous beast into my shop. He's really not that dangerous, mate, Phil says tiredly, looking to Techno, glad to see that the kid is busy playing with the ends of hanging shirts, not noticing Phil threatening the shop owner with a knife. Let me make this clear. I'm here to get some new clothes for my son, some new shoes, then we can go on our way. Your son? She whispers back, leaning in with a face of disbelief. That thing cannot be your son. Listen, there's those men outside for the good of everyone. Let's just... Phil narrows his eyes. You try calling for those hunters, you're going to lose a finger. She only gives an unimpressed look and responds snarkily. And Phil likes her for the fact that she's definitely panicking, yet still says a response that makes Phil want to roll his eyes. I'll lose a finger, lose my life. Which one do you think I prefer? She whispers, Phil raising his eyebrows. Really? Look at him, he's tiny. He waves a hand to Techno, who's currently running his hands along the layers of a coat, marveling at the fluffy material at the ends of it. Do you honestly believe he's going to hurt you? She looks conflicted for a moment. Then... The stories... Yes, yes, the tales, the destiny, I know. Phil leans back, keeping a loose grip on the knife stuck into the counter and reaching into his bag, grabbing a single coin. Watch. He says to her, and turns his head to Techno. Techno, look, come here. Phil calls. And Techno looks at Phil, and spots the coin in his hand, then runs over, nearly tripping over his feet. He runs into Phil's legs, then reaches a hand up to the coin Phil's holding, hopping up once, twice, tugging at Phil's shirt. The woman leans over the counter to look at Techno, and blinks in shock at the sight of Techno just wanting the coin, giving a frustrated face to Phil when Phil only keeps holding it up too high. A small squeak comes from the kid, and Phil hands the coin over, Techno grabbing it and running off, sliding under a table. A coin. Emmy says softly, and Phil hums. 
the blood god has been tamed with a single coin. He likes gold, Phil says, turning his head to the woman again as she stares at the table Techno's under. And soft things. She looks at him with an absolutely confused face. And Phil just smiles. So, do you think you could get some clothes and shoes for him so we can get on our way? Because it really isn't safe for us to be out right now with him. Phil asks. And for a moment, she looks to the wings on Phil's back, lost in thought. Then she sighs, looking at her sleeve still stuck to the counter with a knife, and looking at Techno again. All right. But once you leave, you know I'll have to tell others of this. That's fine. I can keep him safe. Phil responds, and pulls the knife out of the counter. <laughs>